Welcome to Far East Wargaming and another Heresy Thursday. Once again, I'm Richard and I've got with me Jason. Hello, everyone. So, today we're ta talking about the Iron Hands. We took a poll on our YouTube and we had the majority of votes for Iron Hands. So, that's the way we're going to go about it today. Um, we're lucky enough to have a resident expert on Iron Hands here because uh, Jason is an Iron Hand himself. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, I won't say expert, I'll say enthusiast. Uh, but yeah, I've also had a lot of surgeries. So that's where the joke about me being an Iron Hand myself comes in. But yeah, for those who know me or have seen some of our battle reports, our army showcases, in addition to the Death Guard, the Iron Hands, my other path and project. So I'm really excited to be able to talk about them today. Yes. So the Iron Hands, the, the first of the casualties, really, into the Horus Heresy. So um not much of them after the drop site except for the shadow legions and we've yet to see those come about but yes the iron hands themselves a very interesting army with some very interesting rules so well let's delve into it shall we jason yes absolutely let's get started i think it's uh we'll talk about it in definitely in a few minutes but i think it's an army that has a lot of synergy opportunities which comes through in the in the various rules the war gear etc um, so yeah, it's quite interesting and, and I'm, I'm ready to dive into that. Yeah, this uh, is quite interesting. I think a lot of people say it's the, the ability to have grav guns. That's uh, that's one of the things, but also it's versatility in terms of infantry or armor based or even a combination of both. So it's, um, it's taken some of the stuff from the first heresy 1.0 and brought it over to 2.0 and made them quite powerful to be honest. Yeah, I mean, one of the things about the Iron Hands, if we start talking about the Legion rule itself, it's one of the rules that's easy to remember, and it's always effective, which is the Medusa scales. And basically, for your, your infantry, it's almost always minus one for the incoming shots. This also works on your Dreadnoughts as well, which makes them incredibly tough. Uh, and that's pretty similar to, to what you had in 1.0. In the additional rule is really about the it will not die that goes on the vehicles. Uh, which happens to stack with a piece of war gear. So your vehicles are going to get a six up that will not die. And with a blessed auto of simulacra, they would have a five up. Um, durable, easy to remember, very iron handsy in terms of the fluff, in terms of the, the story about their, you know, unswerving stubbornness and, and difficulty to kill. So, yes, I like it. And it comes into play with pretty much all of the units that you're going to want to use. Yeah, well, we're talking, look, we were talking about this. The, the, the Legion traits that are always usable are the most powerful ones because some of the legions have some very powerful traits but they're very situational and here a straight minus one to all strengths of incoming shooting attacks makes well makes it very hard to kill them from long range and does make uh, the contemptors kazi unkillable by small arms yes it does um for your infantry, it, yeah, it does make them a little bit more durable. Where I actually get more use out of it, honestly, is it, it lowers also the threshold or raises the threshold, however you want to say it, for it will not die, or, uh, excuse me, for instant death, right? Because instead of a, a crack missile not allowing you that feel no pain or something like this, now that crack missile is only strike seven, so you can take your apothecary saves against it. Uh, your contemptors definitely get a bump up. They become effectively T8, and your leviathans effectively become T9. Uh, and when you start combining that with some of the other things that we'll talk about in a minute, it makes them incredibly tough to kill. Um, but yes, it's a very useful rule. It's an easy one to remember, and it's it's got a lot of positives going for it. So I, I can't can't say anything better about that. No, it is a it is a nice rule to have. Um, it gives them a lot of longevity and a lot of versatility there. And you've got a quite interesting special reaction for the Iron Hands as well. We do. It's actually similar for those that know the Iron Warriors one. This is similar in the in the sense that it gives a unit double the amount of shots, um, but it's only in the assault phase. And basically, it's it's called the Gorgon Spite. And so, if you did something like a, an Overwatch, you get double the number of shots. Uh, the downside is that each one of those models gets you know gets hot as a as a downside. Um, obviously, it, in the right situation, this can be pretty devastating. Uh, but I've played games where it honestly it doesn't come up, or if it does come up, it comes up on attack squad. Uh, my only opportunity to use it as attack squad gets gets charged and is pumping out four shots each. But we played a game this last weekend, and I triggered the reaction. I think I only killed three rampagers from the world eaters that charged in. So it's not a game breaker. It is useful, but you will have games where it's really not going to make much of a difference. 
Yeah, I think you're right there. In terms of, I think you're finding the the reactions that are the most beneficial uh, in 2.0 are the ones that happen and really affect countercharging kind of things like this, either in the movement phase or in the assault phase itself, where you're suddenly now on the front foot as opposed to onto the back foot. Um, a stronger Overwatch, because this is really what it is, um, is situational, yes. And the gets hot is quite detrimental sometimes. Yeah, sure. I mean, if I'm if I'm going to lose, I don't know my heavy support squad of las cannons to a, you know a charging unit, then I'm obviously going to trigger this. Um, they're probably going to die anyway, so the get gets hot doesn't really really matter. Um, but you're right. I mean, those legions, space wolves, emperor's children, imperial fists, those are a few that come to mind where they can you know charge in your phase or otherwise disrupt the game. Those can tend to be much more, I think, not game breaking, but can can really win a game for you. This isn't going to be one that's going to win a game. It's going to save a unit or it's going to kill off a few more of the enemy models, but it's it's not going to completely turn the tide. Yeah. I think that having a double shot in the shooting phase like the Iron Warriors have is a lot more powerful and has a lot more uses. Absolutely. That one's a, that one's an absolutely brutal reaction. I mean, when you've got an Iron Havocs with with all of their funky rules and then all of a sudden they're shooting twice yeah that's absolutely nasty but i mean again can't complain it's a useful advanced reaction it's certainly not you know terrible but it's also not game breaking either yeah i'm sure we'll get into the iron warriors f f further down the line when we actually get to their army review um well let's let's delve into some of their traits because they've got as all the legions they've got a few traits here uh loyalist and traitor and then one either or here yeah, from Hell's Heart is the loyalist one. This gives the the warlord the fear special rule, and fear with with the way leadership works in 2.0 is always useful. Chances are your warlord's going to be in in a, in a vehicle most of the game until he comes out. Uh, so again, it's not always going to be used, but the part of it that's very interesting is the free attacks. You basically, if your warlord gets reduced to zero wounds through a shooting or a melee, he gets to retaliate, and he gets to retaliate d6 times with either a shooting weapon versus a shooting attack that takes him to zero wounds. Or an assault uh, attack that takes him down to zero wounds. So if you can imagine your Praetor with a Thunder Hammer gets killed, and then all of a sudden he's swinging back D6 times, automatically hitting with that Thunder Hammer, it can be pretty nasty. So I think this is this is a, a good one. It's definitely one that uh, you will think about taking versus, like, let's say, Stoic Defender or one of the generic traits. So yeah, I, I like this one a lot, and I have played with it before. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I think that's quite deadly. It, mean, it kind of really does mean that anything, especially in the challenge that has killed you, is going to probably die itself. It's like uh, attacking from pa beyond the grave, especially if you're using a thunder hammer and you can't go because somebody's using a paragon blade or such or something along those lines. Um, that's it, it's quite. Like, I find it very strong. The shooting attack part has a loophole. I'm not sure if they've plug the loophole in there but it doesn't talk about the weapon profile for range of the weapon <laughs> that you're dying to it just says your shooting weapon hits have they have they errated that uh i don't remember if they've errated it or not but i mean i wouldn't be that guy that would play it that way i mean i think you would still have to follow the normal rules of shooting yes it auto hits but i don't think you're all of a sudden your 12 inch plasma pistol shoots 36 inches or anything like that um <laughs> but uh yeah i mean i think the shooting is, is going to be much less common to begin with because let's face it you're not usually tooling up your your expensive hq guys to shoot although maybe if you have like an armistice as your war lowered with a heavy support squad him getting off a free round of shooting would be great uh, so yeah, it does have use, um, but again, I think it's more in the assault that you're going to want to do this, and even the bonus reaction you get is in the assault phase as well, so it really seems to be tuned for that. Yeah, it's tuned for Iron Hands themselves with their advanced reaction being in the assault phase, so it gives them the extra chance. Um, again, I think uh, the majority of people will agree that shooting phase reactions are preferable nowadays, but this the actual fear and the automatic wounds on death are are very powerful yeah absolutely so i agree again it's a very useful one um i will probably take this you know if i've got a, a tooled up assault hq almost every single time no well, that makes sense but that's if you're playing loyalist <laughs> yes i mostly play loyalist i mean yes in the fluff in the books there were elements of uh, like every legion the iron hand did have some guys that turned traitor 
Um, and the next warlord trade is the Eye of Vigilance, which is for traders only by by uh, by coincidence. And basically, it gives his unit, he and his unit that he's with, the preferred enemy special rule loyalist, which I think is pretty powerful because preferred enemy in general is much less common in 2.0 than it was in 1.0. But where this one also really shines is you get a free reaction once a game as the reactive player. And this can be more than your allowed, um, your allow, uh, allowed number of yes. allotment in a phase. So that can be pretty powerful uh, if you're playing traders. So I think this is another one that is good. I think this is another one that's very use, useful. Um, again, I think if you're, if you're putting this with a shooting armistice, it keeps coming to mind, preferred enemy very powerful if you're putting this on a on a death star hq again pretty powerful um and then that free reaction is just kind of icing on the cake so this is a, a good warlord trick well yeah the, the reaction itself is kind of double double edged there because it's a once per battle reaction as opposed to a extra reaction in a specific phase every turn so you are having a trade-off there for, for for how that works the ability to suddenly use it at any point in the game um as a surprise against your opponent, could really come in handy. Yep, agree. Totally agree. It's definitely a useful one. And uh, like the first one from Hell's Heart, I think both of these are, are definitely usable, unlike some of the Warlord traits you may see for, for other legions or even a couple of the generic ones. I, I definitely will use these and have used these. Yeah. And then, well, we move on to the, the last Warlord trait, which is the one for those who are neither traitor nor loyalist but they're just uh, sitting in the middle there a bit confused <laughs> the silver iron will yeah this one i think is okay i mean it's if you're going up it basically what it says is your your characteristics are not affected by any rule that modifies them so what would be an example of this you know rad grenades lowering your toughness that's one fear right this could also be another one. Um, I think against certain armies, this warlord trait would be devastating. You know, mitigating Night Lord's fear causing abilities, mitigating um, armies with a lot of rad grenades, rad phage, etc. Um, but it's situational. And I don't think you're going to see this one played a lot unless you're, you're tooling up a list for a specific opponent or you know that you're going to have a good chance of playing these kinds of opponents. It's also a bonus reaction in the movement phase, which I think is the weakest option usually for warlord traits i don't play this one um i probably won't play it very often like i said unless i i know that it's going to probably get some usage because against most situations you're, you're never going to use this yeah i think you're right um it was i think in the community popular at the start before it was errated because there was the loophole that it says doesn't affect any doesn't reduce any traits and wounds were a trait <laughs> so that was definitely uh fixed in a faq <laughs> yep again that guy trying to to break it saying his uh, warlord could never be taken down to wound zero uh <laughs> i mean yeah i mean again i'm not that guy but uh, yeah i'm glad that they, they fixed that loophole no it's true we, we we get a bit of everything in all communities i think um we try and follow the spirit of the wording here at Far East Wargaming as opposed to the letter of the word. But yes, um, I, can, I can see how people would have done that <laughs> for yep. that added advantage. Yep. Well, okay, so those rights. are the warlord traits. Yep, the rights of war and, and the Iron Hands have some good ones. Uh, they had good ones in 1.0. Uh, but both of them are very useful now. So starting with the first one, which is Company of Bitter Iron, it basically turns your immortal squads into troops, but not only do they become troops, they also gain line, and they also gain Heart of the Legion, which is incredibly powerful because your your immortals have a built-in um, feel no pain, and now with that line and Heart of the Legion, if they happen to be sitting next to an objective, that's bumped up to a four-up. So you're talking about a model that already has a, a three-up, five-plus-plus for the shield, and now has a four plus 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 feel no pain. It makes those those units very very durable, super durable next to objectives. Um, you also get uh, you know some other benefits. You know again, but immortals have the bitter duty right of war, which means they can only be joined by or excuse me the bitter duty rule, which means they can only be joined by certain HQs like a Moritat. So that does balance out a little bit. But I think this is a really really fun one and a very very thematic one to play. 
and I've played this right of war using a couple big blocks of immortals and they become really, really tough to shift off of objectives. And when they're toting things around like graviton guns and, and just sitting there, it makes them just very scary to charge. So, uh, yeah, I like this one a lot. It's only open to the loyalists. You can't use it if you have Ferris Manus, um, which I think is great for fluff reasons. It could also potentially be game breaking if Ferris Manus and a massive blocks of immortals are all over the place. I mean, that could just be really tough to kill. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, it's a great ride of war and I like the way they changed it from 1.0. It's much more useful, um, with the way that line and heart of the Legion adds on to it. Yeah. I think, I think the, the whole point of the company of bitter iron is the vengeance after the death of Ferris Manus. So I think that's kind of why, and you're right. It could be quite game breaking. The fact that any independent character can, Take the bitter duty special rule means there's added versatility for this for putting them with your immortals. So any character now can come can join that unit. It's uh it's it's quite strong. Yes, it is, and so you can all now, especially like if you're playing Zone Mortalis, you could have immortals and you could stick your praetor with them give him bitter duty and, and stick him in that squad, and they become a, a big immovable object that also can deal some pain because. Immortals have been bumped up, which we'll talk a little bit about in terms of their performance, their output. Uh, so, yes, you can take advantage of that, but then the, he won't be able to join anything else. And I think the only big downside of this Ride of War is Immortal squads can get quite pricey. Even with the points breaks, even with the rules adjustments, um, I mean, if you take a block of 15 of them with a couple grav guns and upgrade the sergeant at all, I mean, you're talking a 300-point squad almost. So that's the downside of this. But any Ride of War or any rule in, in Heresy that's fluffy, and this is a very fluffy one, as well as being somewhat effective, yeah, I think it's a it's a winner. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, I think that it's kind of good in the sense that they are pricey because too many immovable, I, I won't call them Death Stars because they're not the best per se in close combat, but they're very still very good in close combat. It's just very hard to, to move off an objective. Absolutely. And this is definitely your more defensive, I think, themed... Although it could be offensive as well if you're moving those blocks of immortals up, you know, withering the fire and going up with them. Yeah, I mean, it can be offensive, but defensively, this really just adds a lot more durability, and it's a fun one to use, and I like using this one. I'm even painting up even more immortals because I'd like to have probably, you know, the flexibility of running three blocks of them or two blocks of them as, as the points allow. Yeah, I think that we've also found that immortals or just breaches in general, they've lost a bit of their oomph from the initial version, and they're more applicable in games such as Zone Mortalis. Yeah, they are. I mean, they shine in Zone Mortalis, absolutely. I think if you're not taking Breachers or Immortals in a, in a Zone Mortalis game, you're, you're losing out, because they are much more effective in that. Um, but, I mean, just again, I've played this in a regular game, and I had two blocks of Immortals that both managed to get to an objective, and it they just withered or weathered so much fire because the the legion trait reducing the incoming strength the the inbuilt uh feel no pain bumping up to four up the invulnerable save they were really hard to kill so i don't think it's just for zone mortalis in this particular case i think this one is definitely usable in regular games too fair enough fair enough i'll take it from the person who plays the <laughs> plays the legion <laughs> yep uh the next one we want to talk about i think the head of the gordon that's the gorgon that's the second right of war uh, this one has changed a little bit from 1.0, and in 1.0 it was definitely everybody's favorite because, I mean, the sight of all these outflanking uh, tanks, Spartans, Land Raiders, Vindicators, I mean, it, it was actually pretty nasty. And I think it, it was borderline OP in 1.0. Uh, they've toned it down a bit for 2.0, but it's still quite useful. Um, you gain Stubborn if you're the infantry unit type. Sounds great, but I mean things like uh, like Immortals or Gorgons already have stubborn, so you really it's only your tax squad, your heavy support squad, your other infantry. Um, what's very interesting is you can exchange flamers for grav guns or graviton shredders, which are insane because with the, the the you know just how common dreadnoughts are, contemptors, leviathans, etc., being able to spam grav guns like the Iron Hands can do is pretty pretty strong. Uh, but they, the points do add up, so you do, you do have to think about that. But what else is cool about this is you can take Castellax, you can take Cortex controllers on some of your characters if you wanted to have a robotic-themed list, which I think is super fluffy. Uh, you still can outflank, but the, the power of outflank has definitely decreased in Turado with the way the outflank marker works and reactions. Um, I actually don't do it too often, 
And when I've played this ride of war, it's it's either win big or lose big, basically. Uh, you know, your, your land raider or your, your speeders or whatever unit comes in on outflank and then they eat an unfortunate interceptor reaction and then they're gone. Um, but I think the other stuff in this ride of war still makes it very useful with the stubborn, the, the graviton spam and the access, the easier access to robots. Everybody loves robots. Um, pretty good. Limitation, you can only take a single fast attack, which is actually worse than you think because... A lot of people think Iron Hands don't get use out of fast attack, but you absolutely do. Um, your Legion rule bikes are useful, unlike many other Legions. Why? Because your bikes are still getting minus one to that incoming fire. Um, so not being able to take more than one fast attack choice can limit you in some cases. Um, you cannot seize the initiative. So that's can be a, that can be a big one too, right? Um, so the limitations are a bit more severe now in 2.0 than they were in 1.0, but I still like this ride of war. I still use it on occasion. I just don't use it the same way, which is outflanking massive amounts of tanks like like what happened in the previous version, and I, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, the outflank, the changes to the outflank rule have really affected um, its entire use because now it can be quite effectively negated. The fact that you have to use an outflank marker means that you know where it's coming in. So you can move units away, or if they're close enough, you can surround the target. And that there really can spoil a whole outflank idea, or even just an outflank army like you had in the past. Yeah, and I think that's a good thing, honestly, because, I, I, again, I, I felt that outflank was... was quite powerful in 1.0 and this right of war or white scars or some of the units that could do it or the armies that could do it really, really well, um, can be game breaking. Honestly, they could. So I don't mind the changes that they made. I do think that they've kind of overreacted a little bit with the, the easy availability of interceptor. Um, but I'm not shedding any tears, honestly, that I can't outflank an entire army of tanks. I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's good for the game, but I can also understand why some people would feel feel differently. Yeah, I still want to I want to try the Castellax. the The robots have been toned down as well, um, but taking robots would be cool. It's thematic. They get a it uh, it will not die, so it could be fun to take a bunch of robots. And I plan on trying that out in the future. Yeah, no, Mechanicum robots are uh, they're cool looking models. They have some cool rules. Your ability to to take grav guns or your specific graviton shredder really does throw a bit of fear into Dreadnoughts because they are, without specific anti-Dreadnought weapons or anti-Dreadnought units, they're very hard to to get off the battlefield. Absolutely. And being able to put, you know, six or eight grav guns into a list, depending on the points value and, and upgrading some of those to Graviton Shredders, which turn them into assault, uh, you can murder dreadnoughts. You can murder vehicles. And this ride of war, if it ran up against an armored spearhead, for example, or it ran, ran up against a contemptor heavy list, it can really make them pay. Uh, and that's, again, what I think is one of the big strengths out of this is that access to the grab and the access to the stubborn and the other aspects and, and not the outflank. Yeah. 15 points a model, a bit pricey, but honestly, not so bad. Yeah, that's a running theme, honestly. If we go into the next section about the armory, it's it's a running theme with this this list. There's a lot of great upgrades compared to some legions. We have more options of war gear, but the points add up quick. I mean, an Iron Father, your first first upgrade option is basically turning a Praetor or a Cataphract or a Tartarus Praetor into a an Iron Father. It costs 65 points, which isn't cheap. It does give them Battlesmith. It does give them a Feel No Pain. It does give them a Machinator Array for hand-to-hand. -hand, and it does give them a Cyber Familiar. So the Cyber Familiar you're going to take on most cases anyhow, and that's 20 points by itself. So basically for 45 points, you're getting those other things. And this is where the synergy comes in. Because let's say, for example, you're running a Spartan. Why wouldn't you upgrade your Praetor into an Iron Father and stick him in the Spartan? He's going to be fixing it on a 3-up thanks to the Battlesmith. Or why wouldn't you stick it on a Praetor who's going to be walking next to a Leviathan? That Leviathan is effectively Toughness 9 with a guy next to him that's uh, fixing Battlesmith wounds on a 3-up. Um, so again, this is where the synergy comes in. It is a bit points intensive, but it's definitely useful. Um, and I would definitely use it at higher points games. But I, I typically would not use this below 2,500 points because I'd rather spend that 65 somewhere else. 
Yeah, the Battlesmith 3 Plus combined with the Legion Innate 6 Plus, uh, it will not die, means that, and that comes into a 5 Plus if you buy the, I think, it was, uh, sorry, if you buy the Blessed Auto Simulacra, which we will go on to just in a second there, is it's two wounds potentially a turn back, two whole points potentially each of your turns back. Uh, on a 3 Plus, very high chance. On a 5 Plus, still decent one third chance of getting it there. Well, truthfully, stuff like this is why a Fury of the Ancients list in the Iron Hands is, I won't play it, okay? I don't judge, I don't criticize anybody's play style. The way you want to play is totally okay. The way your opponent agrees, it's totally okay. So don't misunderstand me. But I think if you took Fury of the Ancients with the Iron Hands Legion rule, with an Iron Father, with a bunch of Tech Marines, um, you could literally create an army that most forces cannot kill they can't kill it unless they know it's coming um so yeah there's all kinds of synergy options there's all kinds of force multiplier options and i think this guy does a really good job of that um in certain cases but again the point you got to think about the 65 points it is quite a bit yeah i think fury of the ancients in general is kind of a I, i'll say i think it's a slightly broken list but you don't really need fury of the ancients to be able to wield a significant number of of contemptors or dreadnoughts uh, th these kind of things because the way they've written it now you can have three three per three per elite slot and two per heavy support slot for the um leviathans that's already if you put six contemptors and two leviathans on the table very few legions who aren't ready for one could deal with it absolutely yeah and I, that's why you know when people complain about Fury of the Ancients being banned in certain cases um, at certain events or whatnot, including our narrative events. We don't use it at our narrative events. You can still take a lot of walkers, right? So, um, but again, you know, Iron Hands can really take that to the next level, and it can be, it can be pretty, pretty brutal, pretty oppressive for your opponent. It can be pretty unfun to play against. But if somebody wants to have that kind of game, hey, let's have that kind of game and let's let's throw down. I can I can play that kind of list. Uh, but in general, I, I save that and, and I don't play it in, in narrative or friendly. Yeah. And well, let's move on to the second piece of war gear because it does tie in with everything we're talking about there, the Blessed Auto Simulacra. Easy to remember. It will not die on your vehicle. It stacks with the Legion trait. So your vehicles get a five up. It will not die. I somehow managed to forget this all the time. Um, it's cheap. It's only 10 points. It doesn't mean you spam it, however, right? I mean, because you've got so many different things that you can spend your points on, you know, whether it's cyber familiars or graviton weapons, etc. You don't want to spam this. Like, I don't put it on rhinos. It's a waste. I save it for things like Sakarans, Spartans, Land Raiders. So really the the more powerful vehicles that you want to make even more durable, yes, throw this on there. Don't spam it unless you've got the points. That's just my my recommendation. Um, and don't forget it, because I forget it all the time. And at five up, it happens more often than you would think. Yep. Well, trying to get a whole point back is just not something you will always remember. It's not a it's not a standard thing. It's very it's iron hand specific. So I can understand why you do forget it, especially when you're jumping between legions. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but it's a good one. I like it. It's pretty similar to to what how it worked in 1.0 and it's it's not too expensive so it's it's a good one um cyber familiar is the next one that costs 20 points there's really no reason not to take this on your hqs i wouldn't suggest taking it on all of your hqs but your your main guy especially if he's tooled up there's no reason not to take it you you get access if he's in cataphractor armor you get access to that wonderful three up invuln uh i've even taken this on some sergeants um, if I have points, I will take it on a command squad sergeant in cataphractile armor to get him up to a three up because he already has two wounds. Um, I don't throw this on your general sergeants because again, those points add up really, really quickly. And let's be honest, your tac marine doesn't need it. Um, your immortal sergeant maybe, but that turns him so expensive by the time you upgrade him with other things. But again, save it. My recommendation is. It's a must-take, but only must-take on certain characters and primarily your HQ guys. Yeah. Increasing the invulnerable save is good, but just giving you a 6-plus invulnerable save is kind, of a, is kind of a waste for 20 points. But going down from a, a 5 to a 4, or even better, the 4 to a 3, that's a, a very powerful thing. 
Yep, you can make a case on an Immortal Sergeant, but again, Artificer Armor, any close combat weapon upgrade, Cyber Familiar, and now all of a sudden you've got an Immortal Sergeant. That's the price of a Centurion. Just take the Centurion. Um, because your, your Immortal Sergeant is still going to die relatively quickly compared to an HQ that's properly tooled out. Yeah. Well, speaking of tooling out an HQ, they've got the special armor for the Iron Hands, right? Yeah, it's the Gorgon Terminator armor. It's now an option that you can throw on any character. Um, I don't take it very often. It doesn't cost anything. Um, it gives you the two-up armor save. It gives up a. It gives you a five-up invuln. It gives you a five-up feel no pain. So essentially, it's a. It's an Indomitus slash Tartarus armor that's been beefed up. It does trigger blind checks, but those blind checks affect anybody around you, including your own guys, no. if they're not in Gorg Gorgon Terminator armor. Not anymore. Terminator armor. Only enemy units in, in this in these uh, update. Six, ah, okay, in perfect. six inches they to enemy units only. There you go. So that shows you how often I take this. Um, and the reason the reason why I don't take it is I want access to that sweet, sweet three-up invuln that the, the Cataphracti and the, the Cyber Familiar grants you. So I really don't use this. Um, if for some reason you were running Gorgons, if for some reason you, you wanted access to blind, uh, if for some reason you wanted to feel no pain, I still think the three-up invuln is probably better than the feel no pain because it's real more reliable. Um, but yeah, it's free. You can take it if you want. I just don't. Yeah, I think it would have been nicer if this was an option for the Tartarus versions because you wouldn't be losing that invol, extra invol, and you'd be gaining something on top of it. But when you're switching out a Cataphracti, you're losing a, well, basically a 3 plus invol uh, because you will take a Cyber Familiar for a 5 plus feel no pain. And it's only for the one character in itself. If it was conveyed across well if it was in a gorgon's unit that's a five plus female thing for the entire unit but you can get a, a primus medicaid to do the very same thing yeah and i'm sure there's some math hammer guys that have probably run the numbers on this uh, whether or not what is better a three up invuln for cataphracti plus cyber familiar or gorgon terminator armor with a cyber familiar and a feel no pain i'm sure there's some math hammer out there um I just don't take it, really. Uh, again, it's not a bad choice. It's a fluffy choice. Unless something told me otherwise, it's just really not something that I want. Yeah, that's fair. Well, the thing that everybody does want, though, is your next uh, piece of unique armory, the Graviton Shredders. Ooh, here's where we get spicy. Uh, Graviton Shredders. So those are an upgrade for grav guns, and what they do is they turn them into assault, too. Um, they still have pretty much all the same rules of a grav gun, but they drop the range down to 12, so you do need to remember that. Uh, but with the assault, you're still at an 18 or 19 inch threat range, right? Because you can still move, you can still shoot them. Uh, whereas a grav gun is heavy, unless your model has relentless or something like this, you're not going to be able to move and shoot it. So the graviton shredders are great, and they only cost about five points more to upgrade a regular graviton gun. Uh, must take. These are a must-take if you can, if you have the points. If you're already taking Grav, pay the extra five and get the Graviton Shredder. You get more shots. You have more chances to haywire vehicles and haywire walkers. Must-take. Um, Graviton Pistol in the hands of a Mortat is absolutely terrifying because you get to upgrade your Plasma Pistols for Graviton Pistols at no additional cost. They are 12-inch range. They still have the haywire. You can still do the chain fire attack. So you could theoretically have a Mortat getting off as many as 12 Haywire shots uh, against a vehicle or against a Dreadnought. And in most cases, those things are going to die unless you roll really bad on your scatters or you roll really bad on the Haywire table. Your Mortat is pretty much guaranteed to kill whatever you point him at if he's got two of these Graviton pistols. Um, because it's a free upgrade for a Plasma pistol, you can get utility out of it on other characters. But in most cases, Plasma pistols themselves for other characters cost you like 10, 15 points. So I don't always recommend it unless you've got points to spare, but the more attack combination is pretty powerful. So that's a, that's a really, really good one. Um, and so again, if you've got six of these Graviton Shredders in a, in a list, you can effectively deal with most armor and with most walkers. Yeah, I think that the it's a no-brainer for the Graviton Shredder because though it does lose the range, like you said, it gets the maneuverability and i think that's more important because the fact that you're having a heavy weapon in a squad of rapid fire that 
have the ability to move and shoot and some just maneuverability options forcing your unit to stay put so you can take one grab shot a uh, one haywire shot at a vehicle or a dreadnought that's coming in is is not a real trade-off in my opinion no and let's not forget again coming back to synergy running theme of the iron hands the the head of the gorgon right of war units with flamers can upgrade to graviton guns or shredders for 15 points each so now all of a sudden a five-man flamer heavy uh, flamer squad support squad in a rhino upgrade all five of them to shredders that's another thing that's just going to go kill whatever you pointed at um so yes this is a really 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 nice upgrade and it's it's something that you will get a lot of mileage out of yeah how many of these squads have you got <laughs> oh I've, I've yet i've yet to convert them because so much of my iron hands is still built for 1.0 um, and i've been focusing on death guard but i've got I just had a delivery today by by chance from Forge World. It took four months to get here to Malaysia, but all of my bits to convert over more locks, to convert over more of uh, the Graviton Shredders, uh, all of that has arrived. So you will expect to see them on a table sometime soon. Oh, I'm, uh, I'll am i say I'm looking forward to it, but I'd be lying through my teeth, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And your last one uh, on your in your armory, not the best, but th- thematic. Yeah, super thematic. The Armatus, and I'm sure I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher the pronunciation, the Armatus, the Armatus, uh, Necrotechnica. Um, from a fluff perspective, this is super cool. They've talked about it, I think, in a couple of the different books or the short stories. But basically, you upgrade a unit, uh, a vehicle unit type, a single one, and it costs 50 points, which is quite pricey. But if models around it die within six inches, and it doesn't specify whether it's friendly or enemy, um, you roll a d6 for each model removed as a casualty, and each roll of a six, the model regains one whole point. Um, in most cases, because it only triggers on a six and because it costs 50 points, this isn't one that I'm going to take. It also lowers leadership. So that's not a good thing. Where can I see this being useful? Well, we've got the new militia list by chance. So all of a sudden, an allied uh, force of militia with a bunch of super cheap levy bodies walking around your Spartan equipped with this are going to be feeding it back whole points on top of the Legion trait, on top of, uh, you know, any other, you know, um, um, synchronization opportunities you have. You're going to make your your Spartan very hard to kill with this particular upgrade and some cheap bodies to throw at it. But really, that's the only time that I can honestly think about using this. Uh, but again, thematic-wise, especially if you're building a trader list, you know, this is more Dark Mechanicum-type tech or you're building a Keys of Hell-themed list with a bunch of undead, and this thing is sucking souls out of people killed next to it. Very, very cool. Um, but points-wise and triggering on a six, yeah, I'll pass. Hard pass. Yeah, uh, 50, I think it was 50 points, right? It's quite quite expensive. Um, yep, super, super expensive. For Especially for a vehicle upgrade there. And, well, there's a very easy solution to not triggering that, is don't shoot the units around the <laughs> the. The, the vehicle so don't shoot the levies <laughs> yeah exactly so if your opponent has half a brain and then you've you've been nice enough to inform him of what this does he's probably not going to shoot at the bodies around it so <laughs> or, or not more than once anyway <laughs> yep exactly <laughs> okay well that's all of your legion specific armory and rights of war should we move on to the the crux of the thing so the primarch himself ferris manus yeah ferris manus everybody's headless wonder um He's awesome. He's awesome. I'm sorry. I'm biased. I know I'm, I'm an Iron Hands player, but in the rules, he's awesome. Uh, in the fluff, he's awesome. He did lose his head, of course, to Fulgrim at Isfahan, but that's a different story. Um, but he's a pretty good Primarch. He's not as killy as some of the others. He's only weapon skill seven, uh, but he does have a Thunder Hammer, and that Thunder Hammer Forge Breaker is absolutely nasty because it's brutal three against vehicles it has exoshock it's master crafted it's strength 12 um he's going to pulverize anything you point him at uh he has a two up armor save he has a three up invuln save thanks to the medusa and carapace uh he has a servo arm um he has a good ballistic skill of six and he's got all these master crafted weapons like a plasma blaster a graviton shredder attached in that you know that uh that uh um, that weapon stuff that's on his back uh, he's got Battlesmith 2 up, which means he's going to be repairing vehicles and, and walkers much easier. Uh, yeah, he's a, he's a beat stick, um, but he is pricey at 465. Um, 
but he can do a lot of damage and he does fourth multiply. He does have good shooting. So all, all in all, I would put him in, in the top tier of Primarchs, but definitely don't throw him at, oh, I don't know, don't throw him at uh, uh, Lehman Russ. Uh, you're probably not going to throw him at um, Horus, Horus Ascended. Uh, you're not going to throw him against the top tier of combat Primarchs, but almost anything else he's going to murder. Absolutely going to murder with that brutal three thunder hammer. Yeah, Brutal is kind of the game-breaking rule at the moment in Heresy 2.0. Brutal 3 is basically like a Contemptor. It's coming at initiative like a Contemptor, and it's initiative 6. Strength 12, there's no other weapon in close combat that does strength 12 um, in terms of this. because And even there, you're talking about some units. So you're, you're doubling them out. A Toughness 6, you're, you're doubling that out. <laughs> um it won't double out a Contemptor, though, but uh, so it's not going to give instant death for them. But the Brutal 3 still there. It's, it's, it's deadly. And his special rule, the Sire of the Iron Hands, is a nice synergy one again. Like, I think it's a recurring theme with the Iron Hands. It gives a Will Not Die 5+, plus, which then becomes a 4+, plus because of your, Medusa, uh, your scales. And makes a, him a very strong force multiplier for a armored spearhead list yes and it makes him very very tough to kill even embarked in a transport right you're going to stick him with a death star you're going to put him in a spartan he's going to have a battlesmith two up roll opportunity it's going to have a it will not die four up on the vehicle that vehicle unless you get really lucky with you know a, a penetrating six or a penetrating five with an ap1 weapon that vehicle is going to get to where it needs to go so it's going to be really hard to stop this guy from getting there um yeah, a lot of synergy, a lot of great things that he does. And, and again, he's going to kill whatever you point him at unless it's a top-tier Primark. Yeah, and he's got a lot of survivability. The, fa the fact he's got a he's one of the few with a 3-plus invulnerable save. Yep, he is. T7, only 6 wounds, I say only. But when you throw all that <laughs> other stuff on there, he's going to be very hard to kill, especially when he's got a, a retinue around him. Yeah, and speaking of the retinue, they didn't include it in the actual book but i think they released something special in one of the community releases indeed they did this is another spicy choice another spicy meatball for the iron hands we finally got our morlock terminator squad which came in one of the exemplary battles uh the battle where they fought first against the blood angels and then against the sons of horus uh this is the answer to our prayers we finally have the rules for this unit which is so predominant in the fluff I don't know why it never existed in the first uh, Heresy Rules. Their weapon skill 5 Terminators, which we've been missing in the Iron Hands. Um, you can make them a retinue for an HQ. You can make them a retinue for a Ferris Manus. You can even make them an HQ choice on their own if you want to take a unit of them. They have tons of great rules, such as Relentless, Stubborn, Bulky 2, Battle Hardened 1. Um, they get access to Volkite. They get a, you know a lot of different stuff that you can take on them. Um, they are a bit pricey, and with upgrades, they can get dramatically pricey. But if you're going to run at a higher points value list, if you're going to run Ferris Manus, if you're going to run a tooled up Praetor, for example, these are the guys you want to stick with them. And they can take a standard, they can get you know access to line through the Legion standard. Um, a lot of really, really cool stuff and a lot of really fluffy stuff. But again, the points add up so quick. They don't have access to any Thunder Hammers. They do have access to Power Fists and Chain Fists, but those are 10 to 15 points each. You can give them Graviton Guns, which you could upgrade them to Shredders. Well, you're talking about 10 to 15 points each there. You could give the Augmentor, the Sergeant Equivalent, a Volkite Culverin, Culverin for 10 points. I mean, you could easily get this five-man squad with upgrades over 300, plus a Transport, plus whatever co uh, character you stick him with. They are going to do some serious damage, but I think you need to kind of think about what it is that you want them to do. Um, if I'm playing with them, I'm going to take them as a five-man squad, for sure. I'm probably going to throw a couple Graviton guns turned into Shredders. I'm probably going to give them a standard. I doubt I'm going to give the Augmentor a Volkite Culverin. Um, I would probably rather take another Graviton gun or another Power Fist or Chain Fist rather than a Culverin. Um, I doubt I take a Nuncio Vox. I doubt I take a, an Augury Scanner. Um, but even with the limited choices that I just made there, I'm still inching close to 300, if not going over 300. 
Um, and yes, I take them as a retinue for my HQ choice, and uh, I'd be very, very happy with it because they will they will perform. That weapon skill five is so huge in the Heresy now. Um, the battle hardened is so huge, and the scoring is so huge. There's really no reason not to take these guys. Yeah, and they do have a, a tiny bit of fluff attached to them with their preferred enemy, Empress Children, <laughs> for, I think, the vengeful, vengefulness against uh, Ferris Manus death. Yeah, if you take them as a retinue for anybody but Ferris Manus, they get um, preferred enemy Emperor's Children. We have we have yourself and other Emperor's Children players here, so yeah, it's useful. Uh, <laughs> if if you take them as Ferris Manus retinue, it gets ugly because they all gain Chosen Warrior instead. As if Ferris Manus wasn't hard enough to stop, now you're giving them a, re a retinue of Chosen Warriors that can that can uh, move wounds around around or select a, you know respond to challenges, etc. Um, so yeah, they're really, really good, but the points add up quick. So just be careful what you do with them. Um, some of the upgrades are worth it. Some of it are not, uh, but you do have that flexibility and you can certainly go fluffy with them if you want. Yeah. Battle hardened makes them hard to kill. So it's hard to instant death these guys because they count as T5. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a nice unit to see. Hopefully one day they might release models for these because I don't think there's a specific model for them. Is there? There's not. So my, my order, as I mentioned, that just arrived, most people are converting them using a mix of Gorgon, Cataphracty, and, and other bits. So I'm going to convert some up. I'm going to use probably Gorgon Legs, Cataphracti, um, Orthos. I'm unsure yet which arms I want to use for the weapons. Uh, but yeah, you'll convert your own up, and they look really, really cool. And if you actually look at the exemplary battle PDF that they're in, there's some conversions that are done in there that are really nice. Yeah. Well, that's the, the nice terminator squad you have then there's the the one that's slightly more disappointing but still very thematic the gorgon terminator squad yeah i'm i'm, I'm a bit blah on these guys they're uh, they're better than they were in heresy 1.0 and 1.0 they really weren't that good i mean let's just be honest because of the way the blind worked um you can get a thunder hammer on the sergeant which is great but he's the only person that can take a thunder hammer um, you can take multiple Graviton guns, which you can upgrade. You can take other heavy weapon options. Um, again, I just I, I prefer the the four up invuln versus the five up invuln. They don't have battle hardened, which means they will get instant killed. The feel no pain five won't trigger in most cases, even if they get instant killed, because it's going to be a, a strength eight or higher attack. Um, these are the reasons why I don't play these much. Um, I do play them for fluff reasons. Um, but I think compared to the Morlocks or even compared to a normal Terminator command squad, they're just not, they're not worth it in my opinion. Right. Uh, I would much rather have access to those other two units than this unit, but it is a fluffy one. I do have models painted up. I've got 10 of them painted up as a matter of fact. Um, but yeah, I think I tend to play the other ones first, unless I'm in a really, really big game and I'm taking multiple units of Terminators. Yeah. Uh I think they're at five man, they're only 20 points less than the Morlocks. And you're right, against another Terminator squad, they're with power fists. That five plus feel no pain that you're getting is losing to a Cataphracti with a four up. And also, I think the major downside is the weapon skill. Having not a Legion Terminator squad that's predominantly close combat based, which I can't, these kind of sit on the edge really, not having weapon skill five puts you at a massive disadvantage. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, and even if you wanted to make them shooty, you can only take one weapon upgrade per three, which means maximum that you're going to be able to take these at is three in a 10 man squad. So why would you make them shooty in that case? Who's going to sit back with three Reaper auto cannons or three plasma blasters? Uh, yeah, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Again, it's a fluffy unit. I love the models. I have a bunch of these. I just think the Morlocks or Terminator command squad are so much better. Well then, moving swiftly on from the Gorgon Terminators, there's the one, the unit everybody loves to hate and Iron Hands players love to love, the Medusan Immortal Squad. These are the ones we were talking about with the specific Rite of War earlier. Yeah, absolutely. We talked a lot about them when we, when we talked about the, the Company of Bitter Iron Rite of War, but just real quickly, some of the upgrades, they did get a bump in the number of attacks. They used to only be attack one, they're now attack two, the sergeant is attack three. That's a good thing. It makes the sergeant a good candidate for a weapon upgrade, like a power fist. Uh, he can take a thunder hammer, but it's a bit pricey at 20. Um, 
you can do things like for some reason give them a chain sword. I mean, I don't know why you would give them a chain sword. You don't. It's free. It, it gives you access to shred, um, but they can't get the bonus for two weapons anyhow, thanks to the boarding shield. Um, but they're still very useful, as we mentioned in the Rite of War, and they still get access to melted guns, flamers, grav guns. Last cutter, no, it still is terrible. Um, yeah, so these are definitely good, great models, basis for conversion. There's there's a lot of positives about this, and even if I'm not playing the company of Bitter Iron, I usually figure out a way to slide one of these into my list um, because it kind of gives me a, a bit of a rock hard unit that I can count on to be a bit durable and maybe soak up some fire or do some things like this. Uh, and don't forget that they can now take a land raider as a dedicated transport. So easy access to the land raiders is always a good thing. Um, yeah, it's a nice unit. It really is. I just think a lot of the upgrades or the different things that you can do with them is you're not going to use a lot of them, to be honest with you. Uh, but you are going to upgrade the sergeant and you are going to try and get access to those, those graviton shredders. Yeah, in my opinion, for 50 points more than a Breacher Squad, you're only a few more points above putting a Artificered, uh, prim- sorry, Artificered, uh, what's it called, um, Medic in there with you to give you that 5 plus feel no pain. It's, it's really a no-brainer taking these guys over the standard Breacher Squad. Absolutely, feel no pain five up, the, the invulnerable from the shield, the minus one to the incoming fire for the Legion trait. Their leadership 10 stubborn, which is amazing. They're not going to run in most cases. Uh, yeah, it's a really, really good unit that you can count on to be very dependable. Like I said, if you need that rock hard uh, unit to advance or to hold a particular point, these are the guys, and they're in every single list I make for the Iron Hands. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Um, I do like the models. I think they're the way they're, they're done. They're a bit more accentuated than the Breachers themselves. They've got a bit more uh, bells and whistles on the models. It's one of the Forge Worlds, I think, nicer models they built quite a while ago, I think. Yeah, they're so good. And unlike the regular Breacher models as well, they've got a few of the arm poses where they're not holding the gun on the shield. Um, so you can do some some cool little conversion with them that you can't necessarily do as easily on the Breachers. Uh, great, great models. And again, I've seen these used as a, as a basis because the body... The leg, the torso, the head are all one piece. I've seen these used as a basis of conversion for a lot of great HQs, um, veteran squads, command squads, even veteran sergeants in a regular squad. Um, they're really, really nice models, and, and the rules make them quite useful. Yeah. Well, speaking of HQs, other than Ferris Manus in the Libra Astartes, there's no other HQs. They're in the Legacies. Yeah, this is the part that I would honestly complain about a bit. And I know, I know, there's lots of great rules for the Iron Hands, so everybody don't bombard me with horrible comments. Um, but we lost a lot of flavor, honestly. They got rid of, of Shadrach Methusen. I'm uh, probably butchering the pronunciation again, but basically he was the, sh- the leader of the, the Shattered Legions. He is now in Legacies, and his rules are not very good, and he doesn't really allow you to take Shattered Legions, so I hope that that's going to be addressed at some point in the future through future rules releases. Um, we lost um, Casterman Orr, I believe was his name, so the other character that was basically a vehicle upgrade, turning a vehicle into Ballistic Skill 5. Um, we lost him. Autech Moore has been changed substantially, which is a shame because the, the default Iron Hands Iron Father model for 30k is basically a perfect stand-in for, for Autech Moore. Um, he's still usable, but he's been changed so much that he's just, again, not who I would take over a properly upgraded Praetor, for example, in Cataphracti Armor. He lost a point of toughness. He lost his preferred enemy Warlord trait. Um, they tweaked his rules quite a bit where he's not as strong as he used to be. And, and I don't think he's that much stronger again over any other, another HQ choice, but they are fluffy. At least we do have rules for him in the legacies, but like a lot of the name characters that they moved over to legacies, they really changed the rules a lot. Um, and I think they should have maybe taken a little bit better look at that. Well, we can hope, especially now that they've got tank commanders out and they've made, made two specific ones for the, Imperial Fists and the Sons of Horus, the tank commander for the Iron Hands might come back. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, yeah, you could use one of those guys, I guess, as a stand-in for for Casterman or. Um, but I think the one that bums me out the most is is definitely Autech Moore. Um, and hopefully Shattered, like I said, Shattered Legion, fingers crossed, this new book for Cthonia that's coming. We talked about it before. 
hopefully it's going to have shattered legions in there um but i think there was a real big miss here on why they didn't make that character a little bit different and still allow people to say uh people to take nice fluffy shattered legion lists um i think that was a miss by gw well they have been releasing new books new black books um every now and then shadow legions may be in one of them we have warhammer fest coming up i think it's next weekend so fingers crossed that there's an announcement there for something to do with the shadow legions but i don't know only time will tell yeah we'll see uh hopefully something comes out um yeah that would be great but i mean I, overall i can't complain i think the iron hands are a great legion they're a great legion for rules they're a great legion for fluff they're not too over the top there are some pretty powerful combinations, but most of those don't unlock until higher point value games. Um, it's a very flexible Legion, believe it or not. A lot of people think it's all about tanks or walkers. It's not. You can actually still use bikes. You can still use jet bikes because of the Legion trait. Um, there's a lot of versatility and, and you know synergy in this list, and that's one of the things that I also really like about it and, and why I love playing the Iron Hands. Well, look, I think we've gone through everything to do with the releases for the Iron Hand so far. Uh, the rules, the special rules, how to play. Um, we touched a bit about the different rights of war and how you do them. I think if the public wants it, we can come back and go more into how to build a list for the Iron Hands, especially now that we've got such easy access to the new Age of Darkness box set, how that could, could work, and then what you'd add to that. But we'll do that for another episode in the future. Jason, thank you very much for giving us your opinion and thoughts on the Iron Hands. No, thanks for having me. As always, it's, it's, it's a pleasure. This is definitely an army that I'm very passionate about, so I, I love talking about this stuff. And yeah, maybe we will have an opportunity in the future to talk about list building or to even talk about painting and converting because this is a converter and painter's dream. Um, but yeah, it was great to talk about them and, and thanks for having me. And hopefully everybody got something useful out of this. If you're still listening to us at this point. <laughs> well, look from us at Forest Wargaming, thanks for tu tuning in to another Heresy Thursday. Next week, we'll be bringing you the Dark Angels review for the armies. Until then, look forward to our Monday release and we will speak to you again next Thursday. Happy Wargaming.